Okay, thank you all for hanging in here all day, and um, this is exciting stuff. We're going to talk about the very scary thing about preparing for a baby-friendly assessment with Baby Friendly USA. Now, I know the Cherokee Nation Hospital. I know Chickasaw. Is there anyone else here that's preparing for um, a site visit in the near future, or are you just sort of here for... And which, are you, which hospital? Pardon? Shout out. Hillcrest, okay. Any other hospitals that are waiting? What? Integrity. Oh, I've been, okay, great. Okay. Um, and the others of you, anyone else hospital preparing? How, do you have any idea, um, Hillcrest and Integris Edmund, when your assessments are going to be? Have you had your phone calls or? Have you had a, you're going to schedule the phone call soon, okay? And you guys? Same? Okay, great. So I know that um, Cherokee has had their phone call and they are awaiting a date for their assessment. And is anyone left here from Chickasaw? Although we were, yeah, Chickasaw? Anyone here? Yeah. Um, we were there yesterday and um, the day before yesterday. And um, they are not that far off getting ready. And we did a mock assessment there too. So you're all kind of in the same position. And um, I assume the others have a sort of either an academic interest or a long-term interest in this. Okay, so um, what, what I seem to spend a lot of my time doing these days is um, mock assessments and working with um, Baby Friendly USA and different hospitals to get um, places ready for the Baby Friendly assessment. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So this was um, a sign that when Laurie and I went to a hospital in um, Virginia, um, we asked to go to the bathroom and on the back of the nurse's bathroom door, this, this thing was, because I immediately took a picture of it, was this was me and Laurie actually going out to do a mock assessment at one of the Virginia hospitals. The surveyors are coming, the surveyors are coming. Um, and uh, that was quite a cool idea, actually. They probably shouldn't have shown us into that bathroom, but um, they had this on the back of the bathroom door um, right before we got there, so that was kind of funny. Um, so when, with the knowledge that the assessors are coming soon, um, what are they looking for? How are they going to measure compliance? How can you best prepare for this? And then any special tips? And I'm going to include the hospitals that we've been to. Um, you know, I'm saying to Cherokee, it's lovely that you're here, but you're like my model, so I'm not, I have to learn from you rather than vice versa. I think one of the things that um, I told hospitals when I've been there is, you know, I take away a message from your hospital. Um, and do I, one of the most common messages I take away is wash your hands. Like, it's really clear to me when I walk through your hospital that I need to wash my hands. Like, everywhere I go, every bathroom, every court hall, um, everything, and then you know, I get, and did you wash, like, everywhere I am, there's a hands washing sign. Um, and there has been another hospital or two that we've been to where it's the same thing, but there's an emphasis on don't fall or stop patient falls, and every door has, like, how to stop falling and things like that on it. So I think one thing you need to be aware of before the surveyors come is, like, do you exude the sense that you are a potential baby-friendly hospital. Now, you can't say, I mean, we've been to places to do assessments where they actually have a sign saying, hey, we're baby-friendly. I'm like, well, you can't put that up yet because you're not. Um, but certainly, do you have the 10 steps up and not just in some pokey little poster in the corner somewhere, but in a place that people can see them? Do you have pictures of women breastfeeding? Do you have pictures of your patients breastfeeding or patients doing skin to skin? And, and, and you know, one of the other hospitals I did really recently, the only picture that was shown of a, of a baby was a nurse feeding a baby in the triage room, was a nurse bottle feeding a baby. And of course, the minute you tell people, they're like, oh, how could we leave that there? How could we do that? But, you know, you're there every day and you don't see it. And one time was it you, I was with Laurie and I've done a lot of these together, the Nestle at the elevator. The elevator was sponsored by Nestle and it had a brass plaque on the wall and they actually unscrewed the brass plaque <laughs> and threw it away. So, um, then, yeah, it had Nestle donated the elevator, so that was kind of interesting. So we go around and we see this stuff all the time, all over the place, and that's kind of what we're looking out for. So, um, you know, what you want to do is to post things so that people can see that you're baby friendly. Now, you need the sense that's posted in lots and lots of places, you know, don't get nitpicky over, do we really need it? Just put them, just put them there, like put them everywhere. Don't start worrying about exactly, but you, they will check. And I've had hospital checklists when, because kind of I do a lot of illegal stuff with, I, I, all the hospitals send me stuff after, right? So I really keep on touch with what's going on. It's not exactly legal, but I have a big in. I work very closely, as you, many of you will know, with the hospitals, and I, 
have a lot of contacts and colleagues and friends in those hospitals. And people do tell me afterwards what baby friend they saw. And they have been places where, you know, they've said, well, you, you've got to put the sign up in the nursery, even though the nursery's closed, before you can pass. So these silly things, there's no point in, like, not passing and having to wait two more weeks before you get designation because your sign's in the wrong place. So put them everywhere. Um, um, my favorite story about a really annoying... <laughs> The most, this is, well, yeah, I was working with um, the state of Montana. I did a couple of consults with them for um, a couple of their hospitals, and one's really, really stuck. Um, they'd been in the dissemination phase for three years, and they, the state asked me to do a, a consult with them on the phone, and we spent like 10 minutes of them telling me that they could not put up the 10 steps because Baby Friend, the USA, required that you could read them from five feet, and their hospital would only allow them to put posters this big, and therefore they would never become baby friendly. And I just got so irritated. I mean, sometimes I think I've been doing this too long, and I was like, this is the most ridiculous problem I've ever heard. Like, put a poster for each step then, you know, do something. Like, don't spend 15 minutes of my consultancy time telling me you can't make a big enough picture. You know, those kinds of things are the least of your worries. So, but people do get stuck on these very little things. Um, this is from uh, Missouri, Kansas City Hospital. And one of the, what's the name of that hospital in Kansas City? Truman, that's right. Truman Hospital in Kansas City. So this is just really lovely. You can tell from here that, um, you know, they were very creative. This is the correct 10 steps. They're written properly. They have the stuff on the bottom about, um, form, about the code, which you also have to have on there. Just check the Baby Friendly website. You do have to have that on there. But they just made these really beautiful pictures that, you know, just show that it was really cool, that, that they thought about this and they're making it in an attractive way. This is another hospital that Laurie and I um, visited where they, you know, in addition to their regulation 10 steps poster, they had all these lovely baby um, onesies with um, a step on each um, onesie. And this is a game from Truman Hospital, um, skin to skin, um, really nice picture. The Champs logo, by the way, is my logo. It's nothing to do with the, um, pre the Truman. Um, and this is also Truman. So they had a, a very nice new nursery, which they had closed. <laughs> um, and they had these great signage, like turn off the lights, and then they didn't call it the nursery anymore. They called it the neonatal observation unit is open for circumcisions and newborn recoveries, having difficulty with transitioning. All other procedures are to be performed at the bedside. Um, and so that was really cool signage that they had in their um, former newborn nursery. And also at Truman, they had these lovely stuff on the wall um, about, um, they, they didn't actually call it the baby cafe. It was their own baby cafe. I'm not sure if that was really legal. But anyway, they had all these great moms on the wall, pictures of them. Um, I don't think they bought the franchise, but they were, they had a really great support group system, very um, impoverished community that they served, and they had a lot of moms come to their cafe. Um, and this is one that I like. This was from Detroit. Um, this was for Rooming In. They were trying really hard to get the message across prenatally about rooming in, and they put these signs up in their um, waiting rooms, rooming in what happens in the room stays in the room. And this is actually a really um, interesting thing that they did because they, we did a mock assessment there. I, I went to Don with a couple of people from, I can't remember. I went, anyway, I did their assessment with some people from Nitschke, and they had terrible problems with prenatal. They just had not got the education out there. There was no way um, that that part of the program was going to pass. So they really carefully rethought it, and sometimes you do have to be really creative in how you think about these things. So they had um, created these posters. Um, they did a different one every month, I believe, and they put them on the walls of the waiting room prenatally. And previously, when it wasn't working, they had a table set up in the waiting room with an IBCLC at the table, and they said, come to the table and talk to the IBCLC if you want to know anything about breastfeeding. Well, no one came, like, no, no one came. So they said, okay, well, that ain't working. So they put peer counselors into the waiting room, and the peer counselors just went and sat down next to mom. They weren't, like, come and sit with me. They were just went up to the moms and sat down and said, oh, we know, we know you're pregnant. Um, have you thought about breastfeeding? And then they had this competition going that the moms had to read a few posters, um, and then those posters, they had to vote on which one was the best poster, um, and they put them in, and they had like a raffle every month. But the point was they made them read the posters. You know, so they, they read them, and then they were in this competition to get a prize. So um, that was a really creative way of doing it, and they really improved their um, prenatal education that way. You really have to work on it, because they're not going to go and read those long packets. And you know, as I talk about preparing for a site visit, um, prenatal is, is the most um, under 
on the DOM area. I mean, step three and step, step 10 is not well done either, but you can get away with that for the assessment. You can't get away with it for promoting breastfeeding in the community for very long. Um, but um, prenatal, you can't pass the test. Most places fail on that when we do the um, mock. And it's certainly one of the, probably the most problematic for Baby Friend the USA as well. Um, so, you know, under the creative, we put the, we made this when we were um, on Navajo Nation. We were actually, I was at one of the hospitals there, Crown Point, and we had a native healer um, who was speaking to the providers about why, actually why native healer thought that baby friendly was really important and the whole cycle of life and how this was a good thing to do. And um, he was talking about how, you know, everything was in one room, the, the Navajo all lived in one room, and this idea came up, oh, rooming in, you know, so we made this... Um, the Navajo traditional Huan is the original rooming in for the Navajo, and all the Navajo Nation hospitals put this on. Um, then, you know, your staff, you want to both um, promote breastfeeding through your staff and reward your staff for doing it. And again, we're talking about preparing for a site visit, but we're talking about what do the surveyors see when they come. So actually, this, this was what they gave. This is nursing staff in one of the Virginia hospitals that Laurie and I went to, a lot of Virginia hospitals only one week. I can't remember which one it was, but they gave these out, like when the nurses finished their education, they got these um, new scrolls with the um, breast for baby logo and then you guys at Cherokee um, have the best doctor one where the doctors whether they like it or not they go around supporting breastfeeding because they very cleverly bought them all coats with doctors with mums and babies on the sleeve breastfeeding and what doctor isn't going to refuse a new white coat but they all have to support it whether they like it or not um, so, you know, that's all stuff that can contribute to that feeling. And it's really hard to give someone, you know, the kid in the class a really bad mark if they're the most adorable kid in the class. So it's the same with you. You know, they walk through your door and they see all this great stuff. They're bound to be biased towards, you know, seeing you in a better light than not. I mean, they may not admit to that, but it just exudes that this is the hospital. We want to do this. We're all in favor of this and everyone's bought in. And even if you have to, like, put the coats on the doctors, they're all bought in because that's how we're doing it. Um, and I did speak yesterday about IHS, but, you know, that was also part of that. It, it was top-down, you're going to do this, but there was a massive amount of buy-in from the top in order for that to happen. It wasn't just the CEO saying, okay, you have to do this, and then going off and playing golf or something. The, C, you know, the CMO at the Indian Health Service, Dr. Carroll, was engaged, actively engaged with the initiative. And I think that's really important to recognize that leadership, it, it can be top-down, but if it's token top-down, it's pointless. If it's genuinely top down and it's being required to be done, you have to have, you have to devote time and energy and money to it from the top down to say, okay, it's top down, but we're going to actually support you in making it happen. So then, you know, when this, then they roll up at the door, I always, I always say, especially some of you like remote hospitals, like send them a really long route, like they don't want to come back. You know, don't, don't say them the easiest thing. Like, we had some hospitals on Navajo Nation so far from everywhere, and they, it took them, like, days to get there. I'm like, that's really good, guys, because they really don't want to have to come back and do this all over again. So, you know, so it doesn't, you know, but, but once they actually get to the door, um, be hospitable. They've traveled a long way to get there. They do have very strict policies on what they can and can't take. They don't want you to buy them lunch and anything like that. Um, but, you know, do be hospitable and make sure that they, you're nice to them. And that seems really obvious, but... You know, do it. And then going along with that, I mean, you need the setup to be perfect. So you want to have at least one and probably two interview rooms that are set up for the day for the assessors. And it's how, actually nice if you have a sign on the door that says, you know, baby-friendly assessment in progress. Um, and then you want to make sure you have tools. There was a very interesting um, baby at Chickasaw. <laughs> and one of the things I recommended to them is go buy some new babies because... I wouldn't want to have a baby if I saw this doll. Um, so, you know, get, and, and also it shows buy-in. I mean, prenatal, quite often the prenatal clinics, we don't tell you when we're coming to a mock assessment, make sure there's a baby in your prenatal clinic. We want to know that you've got one. And we ask on the assumption you're going to have one. And if you don't have one in the prenatal clinic to teach breastfeeding, then how are you teaching positioning to prenatal moms? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Like, how could you do that without a doll? And the breast, how are all these doctors that never, ever want to do hand expression going to learn if you don't have any breasts around? So, you know, just normalizing it, having these big cloth breasts or something that's um, easy. 
Um, you need to have those in all the rooms so that people are prompted, both the staff and the moms are prompted to sort of be asking about baby friendly. And those dolls should be available so that when the assessors come, because they are going to ask your doctors about positioning, they are going to ask your doctors about hand expression and your nursing staff too, and you need the dolls there to have them ready so that they can use them. Um, and you need... Um, you need to be sure that you have enough patients. Now, so quite a few of you have smaller hospitals, or you may have a hospital that has um, a low cesarean rate, so you don't have a lot of cesarean patients in the hospital at that time. Um, or you may have a, a small intensive care unit with only maybe one or two moms that are in the hospital with a baby in intensive care at the time that the surveyors are there. You'll need to... Um, produce phone numbers or bring moms in especially. Same for prenatal. They will ask you for five to ten, of, of, depending on the size of your hospital, um, prenatal patients, cesarean births, um, vaginal deliveries, and then, um, you, so you need to be able to, and then if you have a NICU, NICU moms. So you need to have, make sure you have access to that many people. And when you do your assessment phone call, those of you who haven't, just to sh make sure you know by the end of that call exactly how many people in each category you need. If you have to um, say, well, we're not going to have enough people in our hospital, then you're going to have to set up phone calls, and you need to have two to three times as many people. One of the biggest problems for all the small hospitals I've worked with is to be get, get enough patients in. It's a huge problem. And, of course, it says you have to randomly select them, but you can't really randomly select them. You're just going to find the people who who are, com, will come in, and obviously you're not going to pick the disasters, right? I mean, how dumb would that be? So you don't pick the woman who, like, had everything went wrong and never breastfed because the doctor gave her five bottles. I mean, you have some control. There's always some control. The huge hospitals, Laurie and I did one with 8,000 patients, 8,000 births a year. I mean, they can pick. You think that the assessors are going to, I mean, they do try to be quite random, but, they, you know, with the patients, it's you that's in charge, really. So you can, I mean, I'm not suggesting you cheat, but you definitely need to be aware of who's in which room, what kind of birth they had, was it cesarean, was it vaginal. If they're not breastfeeding, you should know why, just so you know. You know, just make yourselves aware. Don't, don't play it completely. But now, in terms of staff interviews, I think we're going to go into that in a minute, actually, but I, I will talk about that. In terms of walking around, you want to assign a person to each surveyor. So there's probably going to be two, sometimes there's three, because they're training a third person. Um, but there will be two people doing, actively doing the interviews. You just have one person stick to them like glue all day long. You don't want them wandering about on their own, just like joint commission. You don't want them wandering around finding things that you don't want them to find. So have them with that person all the time. Make sure that person's knowledgeable. We did one mock assessment where the person didn't know the name of the chiefs of OB or PD. Like, well, how good is this? I mean, who is this person? And somebody, either that person or a designated person that you know, needs to be able to access the medical record and explain what people can see in the record. And it looks really, really bad if they say, we want to verify why that baby got formula or why that baby went skin to skin and the nurse or whoever they ask cannot find in the medical record. Is it mom's record? Is it in baby's record? If you can't find it by the time they're there, they're not going to have any faith in any data that they're giving you and they're going to start looking at more stuff. So you really need someone. And sometimes it may be you're charting beautifully, but not everybody knows where to go. So make sure that the person that you choose or well, there is a person available who can get exactly at rooming in, skin to skin, and breast meeting. You'll need to prepare some paperwork. You need to do the fair market value calculation for the formula. They just came out this year with a brand new form about um, purchasing formula. They finally recognized that purchasing departments now often are parts of large conglomerates that have many different places, and they will ask you, um, how does your hospital pay for formula? And then if you're part of a purchasing group, it's a slightly different part, it's a different form now than it was before. So it actually talks about um, if you're a purchasing group, how do you determine what you pay for the formula? So make sure you have a look at that because it's changed, okay? Um, they will look at the prenatal curriculum, the material that you give the moms to make sure it's friend, baby friendly and there's nothing in prenatal you mustn't have anything about formula feeding and they will also look at what you do give moms who want to formula feed when they go home. Um, anything else that you hand out is fair game, they might, they'll want to look at that and I suggest you have like binders with everything. I also suggest you all go to carry if you have any questions at all because I have to say that the mock survey I did at Cherokee was the best one I've done anywhere. So I don't know. They're, they're the model. You've got them right here in the state. Um, 
For the education, the completed clinician education records you will need, so you'll need the certificates of the three hours that the MDs have completed, and you'll need the certificates of the 15, and I put 20 in brackets because some of these 15-hour courses, including the LER, Lactation Education Resources, they actually give you a certificate that says 20 hours, even though you did 15 they assume you're going to complete the clinical five hours. It's kind of interesting. Um, and then you have, need to have some record of the five hours of skills. And you know, Cherokee, we didn't ask you for that. I just remembered you need to have some documentation of that five hours extra. And it just occurs to me we didn't go into that when we were there. So you need to have that ready, OK? Um, I, as I understand it from talking to many hospitals that go through this on a regular basis, it is somewhat serendipitous. You can get someone who never asks for a certificate for any of the clinicians. They may just leave through your book. Um, we've had places where they've talked to a doctor who wasn't very good at the answers, and they've asked for that doctor's certificate. And then we recently, we worked with a hospital that um, every single staff member they interviewed, they asked for the certificate. And how did they pick the staff members they interviewed? They've gotten much more clever about it than they were. And they roll a dice, and they say, OK, it's three. Every third person on the staff list we want to interview. Um, so that, that, that that is not so much controlled. All the control you have is that you could maybe reassign Nurse Jane that day. But that's the only you can't reassign all the nurses, right? So if you have got one that's desperately like going to be a problem, but that's the only level of control you have. Otherwise, they could be any nurse. And they will want to interview the night shift as well. Um, you probably have a little more control over that because they don't come in at 3 in the morning. They come in either late in the evening or early in the morning to interview the night shift, and they will need to see people from the night shift, um, which tends to be a little bit more catch as catch can. But, yeah, that's how they set it up. Um, when you walk into the room, if you have a room, um, a table set up like um, Cherokee did, like this, I don't think I hardly ever saw this anywhere else. Again, it's impressions. You think, oh, these people know what they're doing. They're really well organized. You know, they, they have a plan here. You know, there's other places we've gone where there's only been like two people when we've gotten there. And we're like, well, do you guys even like know? You know, I, I, this is one reason I like working with all these different kinds of hospitals. It's not predictable. The, the two people one could just as easy be in a really big academic medical center. It, you know, I, I say also, you don't have to be a great hospital to become baby friendly. You don't have to be. In fact, it's more difficult sometimes to get these big academic medical centers to even like deign to speak with you than it does some of the smaller ones that have a little bit more heart. So um, just look good when they come, you know, be prepared, have everything ready. And um, it just makes, they, they even had like folders for everybody. It's just great. That's the kind of thing you need to do. Um, if you're a nurse manager or management, you need to be able to answer the questions that they would ask the clinicians. So you do need the breastfeeding knowledge. You need to be able to identify um, who's responsible for ensuring the, the policy is implemented. You need to be able to locate the infant feeding policy. Not all hospitals, even though they have an infant feeding policy, the clinicians didn't know they have an infant feeding policy. A recent hospital I visited didn't know it existed. They're like, oh, nurses might have one. They didn't even know. So you need to be able to... Find it, know where it is, orient your staff to it before they get there, okay? In terms of the policy and Baby Friend the USA, Baby Friend the USA will hopefully have signed off on your policy before they walk through the door. Early in the process, they look at it, they tell you what changes they make, and then just not long before they come back, they ask you to send it in, and they will make sure it's okay. Now, I have had a couple of hospitals where they've changed small things, and luckily there were small hospitals, or there were big hospitals with... Um, CEOs who are very like, okay, we'll just do it type places. But there have been one or two places where it's been overlooked. But usually they, you should, you should have your policy all set. You know, they should have signed off on it. There's a policy checklist right at the end there. And hopefully that's not, they don't want to walk through the door and they have to start with the policy change. So, um, you should have it ready before they come. Um, you need, the, the management needs to be described, to be able to describe how staff and new hires are oriented. Um, and show how, uh, this is directly from the Baby Friendly USA website, how the adherence to the infant feeding policy is monitored. Um, so then the other data is, the other information is like, so what do they like base this entire thing on? Whose data, what are they looking at? So your breastfeeding and your compliance rates matter, and that they will go through with you guys at the interview. And actually, Carrie, you had your interview last week. I mean, they, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's always someone, you know, uh, uh, a little serendipitous, but 
as I understand it from my experience, they um, ask you for your data on breastfeeding rates, they ask you for your skin-to-skin -skin data, and they ask for your rooming in data. And the, when I heard this once, it, they said you can take it from your chart, your patient audits, or your best estimate. That's, yeah. So you can guess, but they won't get you very far if you guess wrong and then they come and go. Did you happen to add something? They asked you how many bottle feeders? Oh, because they were just the reverse equation, right? Right. Hmm? There was some trick. Okay, we'll ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to come down at the end and just add a bit. Yeah. So, um, so they, so they will ask you for that data. It's a fairly grueling interview, right? I mean, you guys fly, passed with flying colors, but it's not that straightforward. They ask you for a lot of stuff at that interview. And the way I recommend you do the interview is that you have a couple of people who are really knowledgeable who answer the questions. But if it's, say, it's your nurse manager and, um, you know, your postpartum unit supervisor or something, and then you might want to have a prenatal clinic person in the room at the same time so that if something comes up at prenatal that you don't know the answer to, they do. So I wouldn't have 10 people speaking, but I would certainly have people from all areas at least present. And then the other thing, you know, it's really good. If you have one or two naysayers around in your hospital, when you do that phone call, it's really good to have them there because they realize what a lot of work this has been and what a lot of information you have to give out. And you, I've seen people like kind of converted just by sitting in on that interview and realizing well, this is for real, this is serious, like we really need to, to get our act together here because they're going to come and look at a lot of stuff and it's kind of effectively freaked out a few people. Um, so in terms of looking at the charts, okay, they will look